Globus. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming. This is, this is the fun session, okay, of the Global G1 Summit, right? And you've mean, got monetary policy, right? I mean, if you ever want to put somebody to sleep, you talk about monetary policy, right? <laughs> That's normally how it goes, right? And I'm thrilled that Horisan here, monetary policy, we are in the geopolitics panel. I mean, wow. So we were like obscure academia all the way up to now we're going to shape the world with monetary policy. Wow, what exciting, right? So thank you very much. Um, obviously, do want to keep this as interactive as possible. We've got a fantastic panel here. Uh, we've got some people from academia. We've got some hard-nosed American investors. And we've got, you know, one of the leading journalists, um, you know, or representing one of the leading magazines, uh, you know, in the world, The Economist here. And we've got a great audience here. So I, we do want to keep it as interactive as possible. Now, monetary policy, right? It used to be that monetary policy was very straightforward. This was about interest rates. It used to be that monetary policy, they were the adults in the room, right? Because when things got too good, when there was too much inflation, or when the stock market or asset prices went too high, monetary policy took away the punch bowl, right? Raising interest rates and slowing things down, right? Now, we live in an absurd world. I mean, two-thirds of global bonds have negative interest rates. So you borrow money, and I, the investor, have to pay you to borrow money. I mean, Narita-san, what kind of world is this? Then, you know, you've got this enormous, unorthodox monetary policy. Central banks are buying stuff. And they're not just buying the bonds issued by the government, but they're actually buying your bond and your bond. No, 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 but not this guy's bond, right? So they are buying private sector corporate assets. And actually here in Japan, as many of you know, the central bank even buys the Japanese stock market. So we are living in a world that in many ways is upside down, a completely new paradigm. And Jenny... How do you think about this? Where are we? <laughs> nice, easy question to start with. Right? Yeah, OK, good. Um, <laughs> well, as Jesper said, I was a bit nervous about the idea of speaking on monetary policy after lunch. I thought, well, at least there'll be nobody in the room. So if I say anything stupid, nobody will know. But, um, but the reality is that I think monetary policy has become a kind of tag for a whole set of expectations that we have about how economic policy is going to solve some really wicked problems we have in the economy. The truth is that monetary policy isn't going to do that, but, but there are some very important things that, that monetary policy is doing and that we need to think about. So I think my first response, and we'll unpack this later, is to think of a number of questions that it's useful to ask about monetary policy. We won't go into the, the detail about what it is and how it all works and all that, but the question is, um, should we be worried in the current climate about the new way that monetary policy is being operated? Does it have uh, risks associated with it that are going to give us even worse problems as we go forward? That's one big question. Um, and the other question that I would like to have us talk about is, what else do we need? Do we need monetary policy to be doing other things than what it is doing now? Or do we need something else altogether in the economic armory to deal with things that we might previously have thought monetary policy could deal with? So that, that's my set of things to think about to start with. And I'm happy to. Very good. And you will have to answer your own questions okay. before long. But Narita-san, you're, you're, you're up next here. What, uh, what is your response to that? And how generally, how do you think about what's going on in monetary policy? So, well, so you, you just well sounded sort of super exciting. And this terminology of this disruptive monetary policy also sounds exciting. But I think sort of this is kind of a fake. And I personally think sort of there's nothing really sort of super new or exciting in this disruptive 
uh, monetary policy, I think. That is, sort of by, by the disruptive monetary policy, we sort of tend to mean sort of things like aggressively buying corporate assets and private assets, including illiquid ones like corporate bonds. But sort of these policy responses are not sort of really monetary policy in the traditional sense, and they are almost like just a version of fiscal policy. So in my sort of understanding, this disruptive monetary policy is just a politically easier version of fiscal policy responses to today's economic problems. Then why do we do that? The reason is simply because the monetary policy in the narrow sense is now almost completely ineffective. There's a strict lower bound on the nominal interest rate so that there's not much room to, for monetary policy to play around with the economy. So in that sense, the disruptive monetary policy is not a disruption or innovation at all. And I think what we really need is a real disruption or innovation in monetary policy. For example, sort of allowing for real negative interest rates by digitalizing the fiat money, for example. So that's kind of my take. About now so it, it is, he makes a very, very important point. I love this, so it's all fake, right? Um, but what is interesting, when you look a little bit back at the genesis of what happened, right? Here, it started in Japan, right? And in the 1990s, whether you like it or not, Japan had deep problems, a balance sheet recession, deflation, and most importantly, political unrest. I mean, you remember, before Prime Minister Abe, basically you blinked, Every 12 months, there was a new prime minister. So fiscal policy and regulatory policy was actually, you know, not functioning. And so the Bank of Japan, you know, were the responsible people in the room, right? They were the only policy lever left. And then when we hit the global financial crisis and ultimately the EU, the European crisis, same thing. Politics was incapacitated. Right during the, the the global financial crisis in America, the Republicans didn't talk to the Democrats. Everything was stuck, you know, in Parliament. But monetary policy is wonderful because in response to a crisis, you have one meeting, and you make a decision, and that decision becomes a story, right? And that decision starts to feed into the real economy. So Noah, as somebody who has to write these stories about monetary policy, right? Having listened to what we've just said, you know, where, 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 where do you guys come in as the storytellers of all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's especially tricky at a time like this when so much is changing and there's so much uncertainty uh, to, to, to sort of um, fit things into a, a neat framework. But uh, that is what we, we try to do uh, at The Economist. And, and what we've been talking about this year uh, especially is, is thinking about what's going on now as kind of a, a, a fourth uh, transformation in, in modern economic thought. So we had Keynesianism in the 30s. We had monetarism emerge in the 70s. We had the era of central bank independence starting in the 90s. And now we're entering a, a new sort of yet to be named era. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the trends have been building certainly since um, the, the global financial crisis, uh, but they've accelerated with COVID-19 and it's really forcing a fundamental, um, fundamental re rethinking of some, some pretty basically held truisms like the idea that short-term interest rates are enough to manage the economic cycle. Uh, and so uh, this new phase of the story, I think, really is one where uh, monetary policy is um, taking on or, or receding and playing a supporting role uh, rather than a leading role in managing um, uh, managing the economy. Uh, and it's something we're seeing even central bankers themselves uh, uh, essentially calling for. I mean, if you look uh, at what uh, Lagarde said in her her, her, her first statements when she took over the ECB last year, this is pre-COVID, she's talking about the need for more fiscal uh, uh, stimulus, for more government spending. Um, now you have uh, uh, you know, Powell and, and, and the Fed essentially begging uh, Congress uh, um, uh, to do more stimulus. So uh, the, the, roles, um, the roles have changed. Um, uh, the role of monetary policy uh, with respect to, to fiscal policy and, and uh, uh, certainly to politics um, have, have changed. And, and I think it would be foolish to expect that when we get out of this crisis, when we get past COVID-19, that we'll suddenly see a role reversal and things will go back uh, to the way they were. Right. It's fantastic. I mean, just to give you one number, this is here in Japan. Um, 15 years ago, one yen from the Bank of Japan's balance sheet supported seven yen of the Japanese economy. Today, 
one yen from the central bank balance sheet supports 0.75 yen of the Japanese economy. So there's been all this liquidity pump, right? Um, and the impact or the transmission into the real economy, unfortunately, has been actually going down in terms of its impact. Now, Aya, central banks Hi. for you as a hard-nosed American investor, right? This is Aya represents the hard-nosed American capitalist free market spirit. Sorry to put you into this role, um, you know. Um, Aya, you know, for you in your world as an investment manager, I mean, clearly central banks have been more than just a supporting role, right? They've been a big driving force. Can you talk a little bit about how your investment style had to change because of what's going on? Yeah, thank you, Jesper. So uh, basically, central bank created enormous distortion in variation of financial assets and really brought every, everything up. Uh, we follow value discipline. So as a value investor, it's very difficult to find anything cheap enough to invest. So we really had to start thinking a little bit differently, kind of thinking out of the box. And instead of just looking at the stocks, we start looking at things like cryptocurrencies, some of the commodities, and gold and precious metals. Um, it is incredible that some of the growth stocks are sporting a unbelievable multiples, growth at any price, we call it. Um, so you know, as a practitioner, uh, a professional investor, it is very uh, probably one of the most difficult period I have experienced in my 36 years of career investing. So growth over value, is, is this why Tesla has a larger market cap than Toyota? Correct, yes, and Ho Toyota Honda combined actually. Um, you know, you, I, mean, I think they discounted next 10 years of uh, potential in my opinion. I mean, it's a great company and a great product, but you know, at any price, <laughs> as a very investor, uh, it's very difficult to uh, understand that. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, there's other things to do. Um, we, as I mentioned to you, we start looking at the precious metals and also cryptocurrencies last five years. Uh, this is really called on the, uh, against the paper currency. Uh, not necessarily we, you know, we, uh, we think the Bitcoin is going to go up a lot or the gold is going to go up a lot, but it's rather that your paper currency you have today is devaluing every year. It used to be two to three percent. Last uh, about two years ago, it jumped to six percent, and last uh, six months or so, because of the uh, uh, COVID response by central banks, twenty percent money printing increase. So uh, this is a very easy way for the central bank to kind of getting, I guess, finding a, a I guess answer or a solution to pay back this debt that they created last you know, actually last 30 years almost. Right. And less painful way to repay this debt is creating inflation. So I think they're hoping to do that. I'm not sure that it's possible. That's still not quite um, clear. I'm looking at Japan as an example of, of countries who employ the, this unorthodox monetary policy and could not generate inflation. So this time, um, you know, every central bank is doing it. So it's enormous if you add, add everything up. So, uh, so I'm, you know, as an investor, we have to think about both of the possibilities, inflation or deflation. And again, as I said to you when I started this conversation, this is the most difficult investment environment I encountered. Right. Excellent. I mean, you talk about distortions and you talk about the inability to create inflation, right? Like I think it was, you know, your sensei, right? Um, Milton Friedman. Inflation always is a monetary phenomenon, right? And here we are pumping up money like we've never seen before, yet inflation, you know, keeps on going down, you know, for a whole bunch of reasons. But monetary policy has become impotent, but is starting to create a lot of distortion. Narita-san, when you look at the distortions, right, that are being created 
right now with the current policy mix. You're in both monetary and fiscal policy going together. Right? And I think it was very useful, uh, Noah's commentary here, that you know, we had this, we're in the fourth era now. You know, the previous era one was of central bank independence. Right? Now it's this new era, and we call it a hybrid era, we don't know yet. Right? But what do you see as some of the key distortions that are being forced, not just in asset prices, which Aya just talked about, but really overall in society and the economy? So w one distortion I see is, is, is the impact of this monetary policy situation on inequality, I think. And the, to, so following up on what sort of Aya said, sort of the stock market is saturated sort of across the globe. So for example, sort of American universities like Harvard and Yale are running sort of huge hedge funds like tens of billions of dollars. But for them, sort of the stock market is no longer very attractive. So in the portfolio of Harvard a year, now the US stock market is something like just 5% or something. And, and much, a much bigger category is a very sort of unconventional things like mountains and forests and so on. Yeah. So the stock market is almost completely saturated. Yeah. And the, the consequence of this saturated stock market is that certain industries and certain companies disproportionately benefit from this situation, which is partly created by monetary policy, I think. And, and a lot of, sort of much of the inequality problem in the past 20 years in the US and some other countries is coming from this distortion in the stock market. And I think sort of uh, not, not much has been done to sort of deal with this problem so directly. So this sort of inequality effect of the stock market bubble right. is one big distortion I see in today's situation. Jenny, what about you? The distortions in the stock market, more companies going private, the big endowments going into real assets, you know, into unconventional assets rather than, you know, publicly listed markets. You know, what, what sort of distortions do you see, Jenny? Um, so I think, <clears throat> I think there is a very big... I just like to talk and I forget that you need to, you know, make other people listen to you. Um, so... I think um, the the big distortion for me really is between the financial economy and the real economy and the way these relate to each other. And I'm not sure that we can um, f uh, pin all the blame for that on monetary policy. So I agree that what it has led to is this um, feeds into the inequality, that as you financialize a real economy, those who already have financial assets are in a different position from those who do not. And, you know, if you're in an economy that doesn't have any kind of inheritance tax, and this is not merely for the current generation, but it's for future generations too. But whether or not that has to do uh, primarily with the way we run monetary policy or whether it has to do with changing structures in our economies, I think is a really big question. And we should be careful where we pin the responsibility because we can waste a lot of time trying to fix the wrong thing. If what we care about are those inequalities, then my policy prescription is let's deal with those directly. We, we may need also to tweak the way we do monetary policy in order to avoid having these asset uh, cycles. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, literature that suggests that those asset cycles are not primarily driven by monetary policy. And in many economies, what we've seen is that as the manufacturing sector diminishes and as services, including financial sectors, become very large, it's that distortion which is um, problematic. And the kinds of labor market that you need and the kinds of education and preparation that you need to position people to do well in that uh, economy, those are big fundamental questions that are not monetary policy questions. So that's, that's one of the big things. Um, and I mean, the other thing that I would say is that while I, I really liked uh, the quick economic history about the cycles of monetary policy, I, in my view is that what we are now seeing is a return to um, a situation that we have had before, which is that we know that monetary policy is not actually the right tool for affecting real long-term growth, right? Monetary policy was for short-term shocks. You can pull on the string, you can take away the punch bowl, but you can't push on the string and cause the economy to grow. So what we are seeing now is a recognition again that actually for that sort of 
uh, economic issue. You need fiscal policy and you need structural reform, but, but particularly in the short term, you need fiscal policy. My sense is that what we are actually, this new era is going to be the era in which monetary policy disappears as a policy tool. It becomes a, a part of our fiscal policy and structural policy package, but it is, as an independent policy, it's gone. Fantastic. So from turbocharged, right, to disappearance. Noah, what do you think? Well, I guess this is where uh, the monetary politi policy panel gets into politics and perhaps even Good. geopolitics. Geopolitics. Um, I mean, I, I think it's important to keep in mind why uh, one of the reasons why um, we sort of turn to central bank independence in the first place, and it's that politicians can be uh, pretty terrible when it comes to managing money. And when your primary uh, policy tools are uh, fiscal policy, um, it creates all sorts of opportunities for, for other kinds of distortions, uh, for moral hazard, for uh, 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 corruption in the worst cases, uh, or, or simply ill-considered um, ineffective spending um, in the best case. So uh, that's especially concerning in an environment like this where many of the governments um, across the globe have already uh, are already run by um, populists uh, of one form or another. Uh, so do we really want to give uh, populist governments um, the purse strings? Uh, and, and if we do, under what you know, under what conditions do we want to? Sorry, this mask is uh, uh, is tricky. Um, <laughs> under what conditions uh, uh, and and with what um, uh, uh, in, under what framework do we do we think about this shift um, away from uh, uh, or towards the disappearance of, of monetary policy? And and uh, there of course have been I, and I agree with. Uh, uh, um, my co-panelists about the distortions that, that monetary policy has caused, but I think as we move into this new era, we also have to think about um, the, the potential risks, the potential um, distortions uh, uh, that, that lie ahead, and, and you know how can um, uh, how can especially again um, how can governments uh, uh, that are already in in sort of or politicians who are already in a populist um, um, mode uh, best manage this. This is interesting, right, because you can pick up on the commentaries here and make that actually monetary policy stepping in, right, thereby preventing the sort of Darwinian evolution, right, because with interest rates as low as they are, with the government funded by the central bank issuing one support program after another, the zombie companies, right, can survive, and they can survive very well. And just to give you one statistics, if I'm halfway right in my calculations, now 73% of Americans, of Americans, right, depend directly for the majority of their income from government handouts, which, by the way, is more than you have in the People's Republic of China. So actually, systemically, America is now socialist, or communist, while China is much more free market. You know, so this point about an economic cycle, and you don't have to be a Schumpeterian or of the Austrian school of economic thinking, sometimes the old need to go bankrupt, right? Sometimes the old need to go bankrupt, but that was never allowed, right? The bad financial institutions, except Lehman's, were not allowed to go bankrupt, right? They were bailed out in one way, form, shape, or another, and nobody went to prison for the mismanagement, right, of what happened in before. So I think Noah is right in terms of the rewriting of the governance, right, um, of fiscal support, of government support. Aya, what do you think? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just an investor, so uh, we focus on the uh, outcome of the market. And, you know, if fiscal, fiscal policy become part of this mix, and, you know, after this year's election, if Democrat takes all the offices, presidents, Senate, and Congress, uh, I think market is already start to think about huge physical stimulus of maybe $10 trillion, that kind of magnitude. Um, as an investor, we are very concerned about that's great for the real economy, but 
uh, we had to start thinking about interest rate creeping up. And, you know, we, we have been in this incredible bull market for last 40 years since early 80s, where, when, you know, 30-year bond was yielding about 16%, or a little bit higher at the time. Uh, we had this incredible tailwind for the last 40 years for the financial assets. And people, in, in general, um, it's hard to imagine interest rates going up at this juncture. Uh, so everything's, as, as I said before, priced perfectly. And um, if this fiscal policy mix is mismanaged, um, I think we're going to have a very difficult financial market. Um, variation being all time high, um, as uh, and you know, and the, and the uh, yield interest rate all time low. Um, if the, if politicians mismanage this, um, outcome might be something that actually quite negative uh, in, instead of being very positive for the real economy. So this is a very critical juncture in many different ways. See, this, is, this is why we like people in finance, right? Because they're very focused on one thing, right? And it's interesting. <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's very interesting, Aya, because, of course, you know, you put the finger on the trigger. If interest rates go up, the game's up, right? Things start to change, which is very interesting. Now, you, Jenny, said monetary policy is obsolete. Does that mean interest rates will never go up? Microphone and something. <laughs> you keep p putting me on the spot so that I get nervous and forget. Uh, no, I don't think... Um, I think the way we will talk about monetary policy will change. I don't think the actual operation of monetary policy will disappear. It's not obsolete in that sense. Um, I personally... Don't, I think we're a long way from being in a situation where interest rates will go up. I think we're in this situation of um, long-term, uh, low real interest rates because of the, the, state, the fundamental state of the economy, and that we have a long way to go before any kind of fiscal stimulus is going to bring us to a point where we start to see interest rates rising because of the balance between savings and investment. I just think we're a long way from that. So I'm not actually very worried about that particular risk. Um, and, but what I would say is that you don't want monetary policy to start unwinding now with some sort of slight concern that we might be getting into that territory. We're, we're so far away from that that at the moment the right stance for monetary policy is hold with what they're doing. Right. That's my sense. I'm interested to hear what others would say. Sense it. So we, we, we are ha halfway through the discussion, so probably we, sh we should sort of start talking not only about the past and the present, but also the future, I think. Yeah, and the f following up on sort of J Jennifer's proposition that monetary policy will disappear, I, I, I think monetary policy w will be obsolete if there will be no real sort of uh, technological advance or real disruption in monetary mm -hmm. policy. And among other things, so the one big technological constraint in monetary policy today is the hard lower bound constraint on the nominal interest rate. That is, the, the, in, the nominal interest rate is bounded by around zero, okay, due to some weird sort of historical reason. And why is there this constraint? The reason is mainly because the fiat money is issued in paper in a physical form. And it's very hard to break this constraint with this paper fiat money. But we can break this constraint if we completely digitalize money and the cash. And the Bank of Japan and many other central banks sort of started talking about this possibility of trying to go to complete resources of digital monetary world. And I think this uh, is one of the potential dis real disruptions in monetary policy. And once this sort of uh, constraint will be obsolete, then monetary policy will no longer be obsolete. And so will, talk to me, what will, does that actually mean? So that means that I have mean, an account It means that you can set any, any in, interest rate between plus infinity and minus infinity. And it opens the sort of the door to a whole new possibility or set of options the central bank can take. Okay, Noah, what do you think? Infinity. 
I think uh, from, from the politician's point of view, it's a terrifying sounding prospect. Uh, and so this is something, this is an idea that's being discussed uh, by the brightest minds in, in academia, and, and rightly so. Uh, but it's an idea that's going to be very difficult to implement, uh, I think, in, 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 in the near future, at least not, not only for technological reasons, but also for uh, political reasons. And, and uh, it gets partly to the question you asked, Jesper, which is, what does this actually mean in real terms for, for an average voter, for an average person? How does this impact the functioning of the economy? Uh, and second is, what does it mean for, uh, for banks and for uh, the financial intermediary function? And that's what you hear. I mean, when I talk to people here in Japan about negative interest rates and Japan's experience with uh, the, the, the slightest of them, uh, uh, there is so much resistance um, and a, a real sort of sense, I think, uh, um, that uh, the policy was misguided, that it created all kinds of problems for the banks, that uh, doing it at scale uh, would, would, um, would have disastrous effects. So uh, I think for, for this kind of disruption to become possible, um, uh, we're going to need to folks like my, my bright co-panelists are going to need to find a way not only to, to, to clear the, the technological hurdles of, of what to do with real money, um, but also how to uh, convince policymakers and how to convince regular people uh, that this kind of experimentation is wise. Jenny? Um, I, I also find it really hard to think about what this means. I mean, you know, it's a thought experiment that drives you're quite crazy the longer you think about it. But um, so try and think about it in a simple way and can, um, correct me if my simple explanation is taking us in the wrong direction. But the way I think about it is, you know, the reason that the um, zero lower bound binds is because it, as long as money, cash money exists, people can run away from the financial system. If you charge people to have bank accounts, they can stop having bank accounts and they can just carry cash, put all their money under the mattress. So your experiment with the financial system won't necessarily work because people can avoid it. And in a country like Japan, where cash is still king, that's of course a very real prospect. Many people are already you know, not very engaged with the financial system. Um, so the point that's being made is that you have to basically do away with cash because that cuts the exit route off. Then everybody's in the financial system. Then you can charge people anything you like to have their bank accounts because they have no choice. Then you become, again, the monopoly issuer of the currency and there's nowhere for them to go. And that's what we're talking about. That if you can get to that point then your policy tools become more numerous because you can fiddle with an interest rate that has a much wider range. So that's kind of what we're talking about, but then exactly the political problem. I mean, look what happens even when countries have tried to experiment with removing large denomination bills from their currencies because they thought that that was a way to stop um, crime, you know, that drug dealers and others use big denominations. We'll get rid of the big denominations and that'll solve the crime problem. Interesting thought process, but um, but look at the problem that, you know, that that created. So imagine the kind of political backlash when you say to people, sorry, no cash from tomorrow, you have to do everything on your smartphone, through your bank account, etc., etc. And by the way, we're going to charge you to do it. Very, very difficult, and that is what we're talking. And I don't think it's going to come any time soon, but I do agree with the point that that is what it will take to give monetary policy back its mojo. Dozo? Yeah, so but, but by digitalization, sort of, I, I mean sort of abolishing paper currencies almost completely and going to sort of free digital monetary world. And I completely agree with you that sort of it's not a realistic scenario in any big economy like Japan in the next five to ten years. But I think it's, it is a possibility for the next few decades. And I, I, is it my, a possibility my, in China, I, which I'm doesn't not, care about individual but freedom? But they started thinking of, about sort of ma making the central banking system completely digital, right? And, and India also is also thinking about it. And, and my expectation is that the, the most likely scenario is that some sort of uh, scientific fiction type institution like that will be experimented in a much smaller and a much sort of developing country uh, somewhere in the world. And that may sort of propagate 
all over the world. That was my sort of optimistic yeah. expectation. So, so this is the cool stuff about monetary policy, right? I mean, people, you can try and reinvent the entire system, and basically everybody gets a my number, right? And the my number directly goes to the Bank of Japan, and they decide how much money you get or how much money you don't get, right? Basically sort of very ultra simplified. So that's something that's out there to be super duper disruptive. And we're gonna to have to think through what that means, right? In terms of the overall management of the economy. Let me return it back to the real world of today, okay? Where you've got a complete disconnect between, now I'm gonna make an argument, right? Where you've got a complete disconnect between some of the policy goals that are stated by the government and monetary policy, for example, the UK government, you're from the UK, no, I always think that you're from the UK. It's, I don't know what it is with you. It must be the hairstyle. You look like Boris Johnson. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> God, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? I, I shall buy you, I shall buy you. That's okay, I look like Angela Merkel. It's, you know, it's, what can I say, right? No, but in all seriousness, you know, where you have got, you know, the central bank buying government bonds, right? the central bank buying corporate bonds. Well, the people who issue bonds are typically capital intensive, dirty old industries, like for example, the utility companies. So if your stated goal is to reduce CO2 emissions, right, on the one part of the government, and on the other part of the government, you've got the central bank buying the debt and reducing the cost of capital, right, for those old industries that you're trying to get rid of. Isn't that a huge policy conflict? What do you think, Noah? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, you've, made, you've made a com compelling argument. And I think this is, you know, this is the challenge, one of the central challenges for governments and, and policymakers going forward. How do you, as we enter this new era, uh, how do you think about, um, rather, than, rather than trying to return us back to the way we were before, um, using this, this crisis, this moment of opportunity to uh, uh, shape a different kind of future. So how do you avoid uh, entrenching uh, uh, or, or deepening the same problems that we've seen, whether it's rising inequality, disconnect between uh, uh, the financial markets, the stock markets, and, and the real economy, uh, or things like uh, 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 slowing or, or hampering the transition to a more sustainable economy. So uh, as fiscal policy becomes um, more prominent again, uh, how do you think about aligning fiscal policy with some of the um, longer term goals in terms of building a, a, a more sustainable economy, building a more resilient economy, uh, building a more equitable economy? So let me do my favorite thing here, a pitch for Japan. Japan is the only country that actually conducts smart modern monetary policy in the sense that yes, Japan buys a lot of government debt, right? But at the same time, Japan is very pinpoint in some of its equity investments with the Bank of Japan buying ESG bonds and buying bonds that favor womenomics, buying bonds of, comp uh, buying stock, not bonds, sorry, uh, 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 assets of companies, you know, that have green technology that create jobs. So ironically, I mean, Japan was actually one of the front runners of unconventional monetary policy in the 1990s. But actually, Japan is now again at the forefront of actually using its asset purposes, right, for to align monetary policy with fiscal policy, not just through buying bonds, but actually directing allocations, right, into those sectors, into those companies that you actually want to favor in your program. Dr. Jenny. Can I come in on that? Because I, I think you've raised a really important question that I hoped we would get to, which is about responsibility in the financial sector and the role of finance in the governance of the real side of the economy. Um, because the way you've described what Japan is doing and where our conversation seems to be taking us is that the only institution that can do that is government. And that um, is problematic, and anyway, we're a long way from you know that being a reality. Um, so, my concern is that we, in talking about monetary policy the way we have, we've neglected to talk about regulation of the financial sector, and aligning the incentives of the financial sector with the things that we want to see in the real economy. 
And that's where I think we, um, we certainly need to talk about regulation, but we, we really need some smart thinking about how we do this and what, what is required going forward. And, you know, I think part of it is about the nature of the kind of private sector financial institutions that we have. Um, I think myself that we need um, more financial institutions that have as their own objective uh, being part of a community. So I sat for 12 years on the board of a, of a credit union, a community bank basically. You know, and that was because having spent my life studying financial systems and booms and busts and things, I actually feel that large banks, while they have an important role in the economy, have some problems and that you definitely need these alternatives, not thousands of them as we have in Japan, but um, some. However, what I wanted to do was to ask Aya a question. As an investor in the financial side of things, and as you've said, you know, that's getting more and more difficult in the current financial climate. Is that forcing you more to think about doing something other than just be a value investor? Does it make you think about being engaged with the corporate governance of the things that you have to buy or the way that the, the real activity that goes with those financial assets is carried out? Uh, yes, actually, um, our firm, Horizon Kinetics, is a large, large shareholder of a company in the US. Um, and we've owned this company for 20 years, um, thick and thin, we're a really long-term investor. And we discovered that the management was doing something um, not so great. So um, we decided to uh, propose uh, a shareholder proposal. So yes, uh, we have taken some of those uh, actions. Uh, I, uh, but also, and as I said to you before, that's one way, but also we decided to look at different asset classes, such as uh, cryptocurrencies and a, uh, a real asset. Very good. Um, I think we're ready for you guys. What do you think? You know, and don't be too specific on the minutiae of monetary policy. Yamada-san, dozo. And remember, it's the um, German rule. If you speak by for more, if, you are, if your question is for more than 30 seconds, you have to buy a bottle of champagne for Hori-san. All right? <laughs> Narita-san, I have a question um, for you. I was interested in the distortion and the inequality that you talked about. While we talked about how the cash that the companies are generating right now is so much different to the stock valuation right now, um, once this starts to trickle down and the big tsunami of the stock market starts to go down, number one, who's going to be affected the most? Is it the individual investors or is it the banks for another financial crisis? And secondly, with that, um, what do you see next happening? More increase of inequality or what do you see? Love to hear. So in the short run, sort of investors and direct sort of stockholders and em em employees and, and, and entrepreneurs around these industries in the short run, right? But in the medium to long run, sort of what I'm interested in is the sort of the trickle down effect on sort of players who are not originally in this game. That is this sort of excess uh, cash supply by the central government now sort of seduces lots of players outside of this specific industry. So for example, even in Japan, the University of Tokyo is now trying to issue sort of university bonds. And many of these sort of uh, unconventional players are trying to enter this market to get, get, get sort of to benefit from this. So in the long run, I'm not very sure about the total effects and the, how the, the sort of the, the, this sort of entire benefit will be divided across different sectors. So, but I, I, I think the problem is very complicated now. But it is very interesting. There is a democratization of finance going on. I mean, even Todai, right, thinking about this. And as you know, even in Japan, you know, the number of individuals participating in the stock market slowly but surely is increasing. Another question, please. We, we have one question online as well. Online. I, online. I Who are you online? Yeah. <laughs> so we have a question here. In Australia, where there's a concern about zombie companies, there's more concern by the destruction of network links and economy, which would be caused by a much more serious and sustained in unemployment. So preventing unemployment is a top priority of both the central bank and government at the moment. What do you think about the priority of employment considerations in Japan by Anton Ru? Noah, do you want to take that? 
Sure, but then I'll, I'll hand it over to Jenny. <laughs> um, uh, since, since there was an, an Australia component to the question. Um, I mean, I think there's a, a, an obvious need in the short term to protect, um, to protect livelihoods, to protect jobs, and to help people get through this crisis. And that's what governments are, are, are doing, and, and, and rightly so. The question is, what happens at the, at the next step? And is there a way to protect employees without uh, perhaps protecting um, companies that uh, uh, otherwise would deserve to fail? So is there a way to think about restructuring the policies uh, in a way that, that protects livelihoods, again, protects employees without necessarily um, protecting uh, employment? So that might mean things like uh, universal basic income or, or temporary universal basic income, which we've seen in some places, it might mean uh, 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 you know, re restructuring uh, unemployment insurance or, or tax uh, uh, incentives. And these are things that I think policymakers here in Japan are, are aware of, are talking about. It's, it's, you know, when I have conversations with people on government advisory panels uh, from the ministries, uh, everyone is aware of this problem, um, but there are uh, obviously, uh, you know, especially here in Japan, um, long uh, uh, long running um, uh, problems historical problems with um, with zombie companies with uh, uh, an outsized level of support for um, especially small enterprises that aren't so effective anymore um, and and you know that danger is something that it's, it's now uh, something people are worried about in Australia rightly and it's something people are worried about in Europe um, uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's, it's a worry that's spreading. Uh, it would be great to see Japan take the lead in uh, solving, uh, solving the problem, uh, not only having been at the forefront of experiencing it. You know who's actually solving that problem? The United States of America. If you look at the data, because the only people who create jobs is the private sector. If you look at company formation, right? Company formation in the last quarter, right? So the months through to June, in America searched to an all-time high. So turning a crisis like the COVID crisis, right, into an entrepreneurial opportunity. I can give you the data. Per quarter, the run rate in the US, right, used to be they create per quarter about 300,000 new companies, right? In the last quarter, April to June, there was almost 600,000 companies. 600,000 companies created, hiring 10 people that's 10 million jobs. Uh, sorry, not my maths. It's like, God, Noah. <laughs> sorry, but you get the point, right? So I think, you know, the concern about the government support ending and therefore us falling off a cliff, we all share. But in the end, the solution is not going to be monetary policy. The solution is not going to be another Shien Saku, another support policy from the government. Right? The only realistic solution is entrepreneurship. Right? That's, in my personal opinion, what's absolutely key. Next question. Anybody here? Please, Dozo, who are you? Okay, remember 30 seconds. <laughs> Hi, this is Takeda from Rakuten. So I was thinking, you know, why you know government has to spend so much you know uh, money and uh, go into a deficit during this you know COVID nineteen, and I was wondering if this is because of the failure of the market to actually invest into uh, you know a positive external externalities, right? So you know uh, somehow government has to step in to protect its positive externalities, and uh, whether I'm just uh, my question is whether this is a failure of the market or is it just failure of implementation of the mar you know our market itself or capital market. Jenny, you want to take that one? Um, uh, it's, it certainly uh, reflects some imperfections in the market. I wouldn't say failures because that has a sort of technical sense, but certainly uh, the fact that markets don't clear instantly and that things can get stuck for quite long periods at below optimal levels is the reason why you have to have governments stepping in in these kinds of ways. Um, there, I think there. Part of your question is, you know, in a sense, why does that happen, and should there be something else happening to fix that problem? And I think yes, there are things you can do to make an economy more quickly recover from these shocks, make it more resilient to shocks. And some of that is actually the sort of thing uh, that Jesper was just talking about. Um, you know, in Japan, while uh, policy has been good at protecting un employment, um, the fact that it's difficult for companies to fail, that there is still this sort of stigma attached to failing and starting up again. I mean, in the startup panel session, there was some talk about 
how that's getting a bit easier now in Japan, but it's still not as easy as it should be, which is why the U.S. does better. You know, it's fine to fail in the U.S. and then start a new company. You need more of that here because it's those kinds of things that make an economy then switch more quickly from an underemployed situation to a more to moving towards fully employed, and then you don't have to have the government intervening for so long. I think the other point to make is that getting governments to be more flexible, you know, when they started with a good idea, which the employment support programs were good ideas, you then need to be more flexible in how you transition from those to the next stage, which is really about providing support for things to start, not just to stay where they were, providing retraining for, for people not just workers, but for capitalists who need to move into a different field, all that stuff. Actually, there's a good piece in The Economist recently about zombie firms that makes some of these by Noah. points. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you are so modest in The Economist that we never know who's written what. But anyway, it was a very good piece, whoever wrote it. <laughs> uh, you know, because it describes this. And I think, actually, since Australia's been mentioned... There's a very interesting um, Australian policy innovation, which is not in any of the fields we've talked about, but which could be very useful. So it's the way we finance education in Australia. We have what's called an income contingent loan system for students in Australia. You go to university and you don't start paying your student fees right away, and then you start paying them when you graduate, and you only start paying them if you are earning above the average income. And then the amount you pay is tailored to how much you earn above the average income. And if you never make the average income, you never repay your student loan because the government absorbs that risk. Now, what we need is a suite of government policies where we, forgive me for using this terrible word, socialize risk, okay, where society shares risk so that people who are unlucky, unable to make whatever changes needed, are supported. And those who do well and are lucky pay their share of the returns to that. And you can adapt that kind of policy instrument to a whole lot of the sorts of circumstances that we're in now. For example, you give business loans to companies who had to close down during COVID and lost their income. But if they come back, you know, like roaring ahead, afterwards, they should be paying back some of that loan. Those that never come back should be, the loan should be written off, but they should be encouraged to go on and do something else. That's, I think, what's needed, really. Any other questions? You're shy, or should we move into the geopolitics part of things? Right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let, but this, this concern. Wait, sorry, who are you? Ah, oh, I'm, I'm Akira Takahashi from Makaira. Uh, well, actually, I used to work for Bank of Japan about 20 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, well, let me ask. You left just in time. <laughs> the, well, it, this concern is too, might be too early. The, how, let me ask your thoughts on the, how, how to control over central bank. I mean, well, for the other ESG investor of Bank of Japan or the future digital currency issue uh, era, the central bank have a more man, a bigger and bigger power. So how do you think should be the control over central bank by the nation or by the government? Marisa san how about you? No, in, in, in the age of the digital currencies, the the power of central bank so will likely to be bigger than today simply because the the spectrum of options for for, for the bank will be larger then how, how how to control them i i don't have a great answer as of now and how to sort of control them sort of while maintaining the independence of the central bank so that that's something sort of we should discuss sort of in, in parallel to the design of sort of digital currencies, I think. So I don't have a very sort of specific proposal about that. You know, what is very interesting on that, right, is that we are actually in a super luxurious position, right? And this sort of hooks up to a point I am made, right? If there's no inflation, this is easy. Because let's not forget, the single biggest source of social unrest is inflation. Japan's, if you look at Japan's history, when there was rice price inflation, you had riots, right? 
And this goes through the French Revolution was because the price of baguette, right, started to surge and, you know, Colette got angry, right? No, in all seriousness, right, we are in a wonderfully sweet spot, ironically, where we have the luxury of experimenting with all these different things on monetary policy, to some extent on fiscal policy, let's be honest as well, right? Um, you know, because there is no inflation. And for the time being, fingers crossed, there is not going to be inflation. But if there is going to be inflation, what do you think? How quickly will central banks start to raise interest rates? <laughs> Sorry, just to... Uh, very tricky question, uh, and, and it kind of gets to the crux of, of uh, 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 the next phase. Uh, I, I think what we saw last time, uh, or sorry, I should say what we saw after the global financial crisis was, was central banks and, and governments reacting a bit too quickly, uh, moving towards austerity, moving towards tightening um, uh, too soon. Um, so. I'm glad I'm not sitting in a central bank now and, and not um, going to have to be making that decision because it really is a, a, a fine line and, and there's a risk of being uh, being too slow and things getting out of control. There's also a risk of, of being too quick and uh, clamping down on a recovery before it, it actually um, has a chance to, to get going. I mean, this, the exit, I mean, we're in a wonderful situation right now. We don't know how good we have it. I mean, that sounds terrible to say during the COVID period. But Aya, what do you think? Yes. When, when, is, when, when, when are rates going up? So recently, I'm sure you're aware, but the uh, Federal Reserve Board changed the priority. It used to be first uh, stability of the financial market was their number one priority. And second was the inflation. Number three was full employment. But they changed number two and number three recently. So now number one is still stability of the financial market. But second is for employment. And inflation concern came to the third. So this makes me believe that they will wait. They're not going to act quickly, even some of the you know indications start picking up. But you know, inflation number is kind of a um, uh, manufactured to suit the central bank bank's flexibility. So it really doesn't reflect real level of inflation, in my opinion. I mean, if you look at, you know, some of the housing prices last uh, 10 years, or well, 20 years, actually, it went up a lot, much faster than CPI indicates. Um, so, you know, in real sense, this money printing really showed up in the price of, you know, goods, or no goods, but I'm sorry, manufactured goods, but uh, things like houses, things like art, things like vintage cars that, you know, uh, and maybe have people, 1%, uh, uh, top 1% like to have. So um, it's hope, you know, inflation argument is sometimes very, very misleading, in my opinion. And also it's very dangerous to assume that this world of no inflation or disinflation continues and a very low interest rates stays. So, uh, uh, you know, as I said to you, I think we're at the very difficult juncture, but also it could be a very critical juncture from what we know, we have lived last 40 years to something very different going forward. Aya, thank you very much. And I want to thank all the panelists. I think you will agree, you know, I mean, God, you know, this is a complex, complicated issue. And it's kind of nice because we actually all stand here and sort of nobody has a real answer, right? Um, you kind of make it up as you go. But I think that, you know, particularly Japan deserves much more credit than it commonly, um, you know, receives for actually running experimental policy but actually refining that experimental policy by actually adding a qualitative element, right, to the intervention in the economy that the central bank does. Like I mentioned, you know, with the ESG programs that could obviously be taken much further, but I do think that other central banks, whether it's the Federal Reserve, whether it's the ECB, have a lot that they can learn for it. One final food for thought, there is one central bank that doesn't do any of this the People's Republic of China. So if you talk about a worry about a decoupling on the global scene, right, make no mistake, right, what the People's Republic of China is doing, right, 
The starting point obviously is very different because it's a communist command system where there was no such thing as Noah mentioned, central bank independence, right? But in the current counter policy to the crisis, the one country that is not printing money is the central bank of the People's Republic of China. I want to thank you very much. Uh, I hope that we can continue this discussion. Uh, please feel free to contact us at any point in time. Um, and I'm very sad that nobody went over the 30 second question rule because we would have all loved to drink a little bit of champagne. Thank you very much. Globus.